Hi, I'm Sal Mercagliano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University, a former Merchant Mariner and an Adjunct Professor of Maritime Industry Policy at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. Welcome to this episode of Maritime Industry Today. What's going on with the Colonial Pipeline Edition? So for those of you who may be unaware and wondering why is Sal talking about the Colonial Pipeline when I talk about ships all the time? Well, you're about to find out. The Colonial Pipeline, which is a massive undertaking, it's a huge pipeline that runs between Houston, Texas and New Jersey. I'll pull up an image here for you. Here we go. Uh, this is the map of it right here. There we go. Runs from Houston, Texas, all the way up to New Jersey is a pipeline that basically distributes fuel, uh, gasoline, diesel, aviation fuel. It was actually designed to support US military bases predominantly. It's one of the reasons why, for example, you see this little spoke leg here in North Carolina, which goes down to Fort Bragg and Pope Army Air Force Base down here. We also see another one goes up here, Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. This pipeline is essential for moving oil, aviation fuel, diesel fuel between the refineries of Houston, Texas, up into the heartland along the eastern seaboard of the United States. It is absolutely massive. This is the uh, uh, website here for the Colonial Pipeline, talking about it. And they have a little uh, graphic down here. I thought that was really interesting. Here you go. 5,500 miles of pipe, seven airports, service directly, airport distribution right there, for your fuel through 14 states, 1,100 million gallons of fuel transported daily. So, Sal, why are we worried about the Colonial Pipeline? Well, Reuters story right here, U.S. government working to help top fuel pipeline operator after cyber attack. The Colonial Pipeline was a victim of a malware attack, or more specifically, ransomware attack. What we know so far from the story, and again, the story is still developing at this point, this is Sunday, uh, May uh, uh, 9th, is that the Colonial Pipeline had to shut down the pipeline because of their computers getting infected with this malware. Uh, as far as we know, there's no breakage in the pipeline. There's no damage of parts or pumps or anything along those lines. We just know they shut down the pipeline for right now. And this pipeline has been in existence since 1962. And one of the reasons for the existence of this pipeline actually goes back to World War II. During World War II, when the United States entered World War II after December 7, 1941, four days later, Germany attacks the United States, declares war on it. And they immediately sent U-boats across the Atlantic to attack the East Coast of the United States. I'm getting ready to do a talk on Tuesday regarding this specific issue, as a matter of fact, for the NOAA Monitor Marine Sanctuary. The attack by the Germans, which went on for about six months, from about December of, actually about January of 1942 to about August of 1942, decimated shipping up and down the East Coast, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Caribbean. And one of the things that was targeted specifically by the Germans were oil tankers. Oil tankers were a big target for the Germans. They knew that hitting the oil, moving between the U.S. oil refineries in the Gulf Coast up to the manufacturing sites in the Northeast and Southeast was essential. This pipeline did not exist at the time. So all the oil had to move along the coast. And coast-wise, they became very susceptible to damage. During World War II, one of the things that they did to offset the loss of, of oil tankers was to start constructing pipelines. What was initially the plantation pipeline, which was a smaller version of this, was built. But the decision was made after World War II to construct not just the pipeline system, but the interstate highway system. And much as the U.S. moved cargo by ships, um, that we also move oil by ships prior to this. So before the interstate highway system kicks up in 1955, before the colonial pipeline system kicks up in 1962, almost all trade went by ships. There was a very large, robust coastal trade operating along the coast of the United States. It had been protected by legislation going back to the founding of the United States, reaffirmed in 1817, and then reaffirmed again in 1920 under the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, sometimes referred to as the Jones Act. So why are we talking about this today? Well, the shutdown of the pipeline means oil and fuel is not gonna move. We don't know when this pipeline is going to open back up again. We've seen this pipeline shut down because a hurricane comes rolling into the Gulf. They shut the oil pipeline down for a few days. Gas prices peak along the route because now they're not getting the oil they typically do. And what we do know now is that nothing is flowing which means the oil that are in the tanks right now are what's available for everyone. That's not meant to cause a, a panic. There's a lot of oil and gas available right now. But what's going to have to supplement this is tankers. And since this is along the coastwise United States, you can only use tankers that meet the Jones Act 
certification back from 1920. These ships have to be U.S. built, U.S. flagged, U.S. crewed, and U.S. operated. There is a fleet of vessels within the Jones Act that does this, specifically this fleet right here. There are 180 vessels larger than 1,000 gross tons besides offshore supply vessels that meet this requirement. Of those, 57 of them are tankers. And this is the list as put out by the Maritime Administration as of March 16th, 2021. What this means is these tankers specifically are going to have to pick up the, the pace here and pick up the slack by the closing of the colonial pipeline. Now, 57 tankers sounds like a lot of tankers. Some of them are pretty big tankers and everything. But as you'll see, it's actually not as big as, as we think it is. The Jones Act fleet, which has come under attack for repeated reasons, one of them is the ships are expensive to build because you have to build in U.S. ports. Uh, most of these vessels, all these vessels specifically, have been built after 1990 because of the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, which requires double hull vessels. Uh, this happened after the Exxon, Val Exxon Valdez accident of 1989. But more importantly, lots of times these tankers are used in trade where the oil pipeline isn't. So, for example, if you look at this pipeline here, one of the things you'll see, for example, is Florida is not in this pipeline. New England is not in this pipeline system. Florida doesn't allow the pipeline in for a variety of reasons. So oil tankers will load oil in Houston and go to Tampa. They'll go to uh, uh, Miami. They'll go to Jacksonville. You'll also see oil loaded in Houston actually go up here into the Philadelphia region. Why? Because there are refineries there. It's the end of the pipeline. It doesn't always get enough fuel going through the pipeline. So you'll see oil coming up there. And then you see oil going up into the New England region. Because again, New York won't allow the pipeline to cross into New York. They, they do this for oil. They do this for natural gas. New York stops everything from crossing it into New England. New Yorkers just don't like New England, I guess. They don't, by the way. I'm from New York. I can tell you that right now. Uh, this means now the Jones Act fleet is going to have to pick up this slack. And this is one of the reasons why there is a Jones Act fleet. There's a lot of debate about this, and, and I'm a vocal commentator on this issue. I will not hide my opinion. I think the Jones Act provides a national security element to the United States. We need a merchant marine as a world power, an ocean power, a sea power. I think we need it. I am not telling you the Jones Act is perfect by any means. It needs reform. It needs revision in many ways. But without the Jones Act right now, we would not have tankers along the coast that can basically pick up this slack, in my opinion. And let's talk about that, because again, I, I like to lay out facts for you and for you to judge and make your own opinions. So here are the 57 ships that make this up. And I'll go through them here as, as they are by operators. Now, some of these operators I should mention are, are sub operators for larger companies. And so I'll go through them here and talk about them. So the first one here, the four Alaska tanker companies. So these are big Alaska class tankers. These, these are big monster ships. Uh, matter of fact, these vessels have a military application. This style of vessel, the Alaska tankers is the vessels used for the U.S. Navy's uh, expeditionary support dock and the ex expeditionary support bases. There are four of these. Two of them are being used right now in the Alaska to California trade. They're, they're getting fuel out of Valdez and bring them down there. Two are actually hauling oil overseas right now. So the four of them are operating in the Pacific, not available. They're basically large crude carriers. So you would not see them basically available for this. Next, you have, I'm going to jump down here to Chevron because there's a little bit of a jump here. And, and so I want to clear these out. So Chevron, uh, which is a huge, massive corporation, obviously, Chevron is just, just tremendous. And back in the 1970s and 80s, basically, you saw the seven sisters, the seven big oil companies controlled all the, almost all the world's oil tankers. Uh, oil companies were interesting. They are, they are textbook examples of what's called vertical integration. Uh, when we teach international business, you talk about horizontal integration, vertical integration. Vertical integration means you control all aspects from the production of the oil, basically getting the oil out of the ground. You control oil wells. You have the refinery. You have the distribution tankers. You have uh, oil carriers on, on land, trucks to distribute it. And then you have gas stations that do it. And the seven sisters, which are the, were the seven big shipping uh, oil companies, Chevron, Exxon, Gulf, Mobil, BP, Texaco, and Amoco, uh, all of them had large tanker fleets. Uh, they controlled this huge, massive tanker fleet. Remember, one of the best jobs in the world was working for oil tanker fleets, sailing on oil tankers. They were great, great jobs. Well, 
1970, 1980, Amoco Cadiz, Exxon Valdez, maybe not a bright, bright idea to have your name plastered on vessels that are going to spill oil everywhere. And so a lot of the oil companies got out of this business. Chevron has kept their fleet, actually. And they're one of the few companies that has done that. Uh, and so we see them operating in this way. And so they operate, as you'll see right here, several vessels. Uh, four of them, I believe. Yep, here you go. The California Voyager, Florida Voyager, Mississippi Voyager, Texas Voyager. They're available. They're split between the coasts. So you see them operating on both coasts. So you definitely have them available for use. And now they're in operation right now, so they're going to have to pick up uh, product. Next, you have a group of tankers. I'm going to run through them all together. This is American Petroleum Tankers, the Sitco, Crowley, Alaska. And these two in the Crowley, Alaska are in the Alaska trade. So they're really not available. They're very much like the Alaska tankers I talked about before. That's California, Washington. So here you have the American Petroleum Tankers uh, right here. This is American Endurance, Bay State, Garden State, Lone Star State, Magnolia State, American Liberty. And then you jump down here, Palmetto State, and then all the way here, the other Crowleys from America Pride, all the way down here to the Oregon. All those are vessels of Crowley. And Crowley operates them under a, a group of uh, uh, ships. Let me pull that up here. There we go. Uh, Crowley American Petroleum Tankers, APT. They operate and you'll see them listed here. Uh, large fleet, uh, in addition to the traditional tankers, there's the Golden State right there. They also run what they call tugs and barges, articulated tugs and barges, which allows them to haul even more oil than that. Uh, tugs and barges, uh, they basically, they, these articulated tugs and barges, you have a barge, the tug actually hooks into the barge. It becomes one large vessel. They move the barge, detach and hook into an empty barge go haul it and pick it up. It's almost like containerization for fuel. That was the concept of articulating tugs and barges. So Crowley has a pretty substantial fleet. They run a, a fairly large fleet, as you'll see here. And the other thing that's unique about Crowley right now is some of their vessels are currently laid up. The tanker market had gotten slow. There was a, a decrease in demand for fuel and oil. Again, we have not seen a really a, a peak rise Again, here, there was an issue uh, early in 2020 where you could not keep a tanker empty. I mean, just if you had a tanker, you were, you were chartering it because they had to store oil on it because the production facilities were in full gear, pumping oil out all the time. Well, they cleared that backlog once people, especially in the United States, started driving and fuel, inc fuel increases have, have, have gone up. And so we've started seeing that move a bit, a bit again, and we're seeing that happen now. You're seeing increased fuel costs in the United States. Why is it? Well, some people want to blame changes of political administration. That's not true. The reason that we see increased fuel crisis is during the midst of COVID, when COVID was hitting hard, OPEC Russia flooded the market with oil. I mean, flooded it. Cheap oil. I mean, if you look, remember back during COVID, you can get all gasoline very cheap, under $2 a gallon. In North Carolina, where I live, it was dollar something a gallon. It was great. I, I, I filled my car. I wouldn't fill the back seat of my car up with, with gasoline. It was so cheap. But the reason they were doing that is because they were trying to run out the fracking businesses, the, the shale oil companies. And they did. They ran Chesapeake out of business. Uh, it was pretty effective. And what that meant was now is the U.S. doesn't have as much fuel being pulled out of the ground as it previously did. And that decreased the need to transport oil. And so some of these tankers got laid up and we see that right now. So for example, I pulled up this list earlier, the Garden State, the Lone Star State and the Pelican State have been laid up for Crowley sitting there. Basically there wasn't enough business for them. So they put them in uh, basically a reduced operating status. Fortunately, they're available and I'm sure they're gonna be broken out here fairly soon to be used for that. And so Crowley is gonna be able to provide some additional tonnage Next you have right here, let's pull down this list a little bit here, the Overseas Shipping Group. So Overseas Shipping, these are the ships with the overseas uh, plastered in front of them. Uh, overseas Ship Management, OSG, they operate a fleet of vessels. I think I got them here, there we go. There's the OSG fleet. Uh, again, same thing here. We have some of the OSG fleet that is laid up that can now provide services. Uh, OSG has laid up the Overseas Key West, the Long Beach, the Nicosia, the Tampa, the Texas City, and the Anna Cortez. So a fairly substantial amount of tonnage sitting there that's been laid up by OSG. I imagine 
union halls are getting contacted right now. Crews are being called up. Uh, if we go and, and look at a story that just hit the just hit out on uh, G Captain here, the G Captain story right here. Oil traders work to avert shortages after cyber attack on major U.S. pipeline. They're already talking here about getting tankers and and barges up and running to start moving oil up and down the coast. With as long as the pipeline is shut down, this is going to cause problems. And so here we're seeing those stories already being listed right here. Again, this talks about it and there'll be more of these stories coming up here, coming in and we're gonna see this kind of play out. Now, some of the other issues that are going on here is alternative sources. They're talking here about uh, the plantation pipeline, uh, which, which can provide some fuel to it, but again, not as much as the colonial pipeline can. So again, OSG is one of those companies, we're gonna see them providing their, their tankers. I would expect to see those vessels I mentioned activated and back out there. Uh, other tankers we have listed here, Polar, uh, the Polar tankers right here, uh, pull those up here, there we go. Polar tankers, again, this is another uh, group. They are, on the, uh, uh, they are on the West Coast. I think I had Polar up here, maybe I didn't pull them up. Hang on a second, let me pull them up for you. There they go. They're under Conoco Phillips. These are the polar tankers. Uh, they're operating on the West Coast. Again, they operate largely between Valdez, Alaska and the West Coast. So they're basically being used for that. So they really would not be able to be used. Although you could see vessels shifted out of that trade if the necessity is there to shift them through the Panama Canal, swing them to the Gulf Coast to start loading that. Uh, you see some other vessels here, the Sulphur Enterprise, uh, which is a, a, a chemical tanker. You also see some other ones down here, Chemical Pioneer in Houston. Those are out of U.S. shipping right here. They, they do uh, petroleum and they also do chemical tank, um, um, uh, chemicals being moved. They also have a fleet of ATBs they use, these articulating tug barges that are being used. So you have that as an alternative. And then the last group there are the Sea Bulkers. Uh, sea Bulk, which is part of Sea Corps, they have a fleet of vessels that can also be used to start moving them. So 57 tankers in the U.S. Merchant Marine in the Jones Act fleet that are available to be called upon to uh, basically start hauling oil for the United States while the colonial pipeline is down. And again, there's a lot of issues associated with this. Uh, a lot of critics are going to come out and sit there and say we should be able to spot charter foreign vessels on the foreign market. Well, the issue right now is tanker market has been down, it's been down quite a bit, repressed down a bit, but now it's peaking back up again. OPEC and Russia are flooding the market once again with oil. Uh, who did this ransomware attack is going to be another issue. We've seen a lot of these coming out of Russia and Ukraine areas. Uh, the container companies have been hit by multiple cyber attacks over the years. You had a massive one against Maersk in 2017, the Notch Pietia. And then last year, Mediterranean Shipping Company, CMA, the IMO, they were all hit. Uh, even even uh, Costco, the Chinese overseas shipping company, were hit by these massive cyber attacks. And these cyber attacks hit the computer systems in the headquarters. They try to break down the ability to move cargo, again, on container ships. You know, the cyber attacks aren't trying to take over the ships. That's not what they're doing. What they're trying to do is break up the systems to load the vessels so that you don't know where containers are supposed to go, which effectively stops everything. In the case of the pipeline, if you get into the control systems, you can cause pipes to rupture. You know, you can cause really bad things, obviously, to happen. And now you need a backup to this. One of the things that the United States has been trying to do is build up its tanker fleet. There's a program called the Voluntary Tanker uh, Agreement, the VTA, where they're trying to build up the tanker fleet right now. That has not yet really gotten a lot of traction to do it. Uh, back in the day, the US military, the Navy would, would employ a lot of tankers, commercial tankers to move fuel to resupply its oilers. The oilers are the fleet support vessels. Uh, these vessels provide uh, direct fleet support to the US Navy. This is the USNS Walter S. Deal. It's one of the Navy's uh, oilers. The, the Navy has a fleet of 15 of these oilers. Uh, they're crewed by merchant mariners, mariners who uh, work for the Military Sealift Command. But in previous times, prior to the end of the Cold War, basically civilians would man vessels that would be the feeder vessels. They would get the fuel from, from the refineries, from, from the depots, bring them out to Navy replenishment vessels, refuel the Navy replenishment vessels, then the Navy vessels would support the battle group. Now what they've done is they cut that. 
now instead of having what they call a, a, a shuttle ship to go between the depot and the replenishment vessel, and then the replenishment vessel stays on station, the station ship, they just have one vessel now that does both of that. And what that has done is basically increase the operating tempo, the operating uh, uh, time for these vessels, worn these tankers out. This is Walter S. Deal. She's down in Norfolk right now in terrible condition. Just, just She's supposed to deploy. She's, she's slated to be uh, uh, replaced by a new class of tankers being built by the U.S. Navy for the Military Seal Command at NASCO in San Diego, the John Lewis class. But the problem is the Navy is not, and, and not looking at this, in, in my opinion, in enough detail, counting on commercial tankers to fill this in. Uh, commercial tankers carry about twice the capacity of, of a ship like the deal here. And what that can do then is provide that needed replenishment. When the military seal of command was created way back in 1949, there were 55 commercial tankers in that fleet. Today, the military seal of command charters two to provide the fuel needed for all its forward deployed bases. And that's not enough in my opinion. It's a, it's a big issue we see. And so the shutdown here of the Colonial Pipeline then is a major issue. Now, this may be opened up by tomorrow and up and running. We will still see a bit of a, a shortfall. We're going to see a quick little spike in fuel prices. You're probably seeing it right now. But again, it highlights an issue. Future conflicts, future ways to hit the United States are not going to be overt direct attacks. It's going to be this type of infrastructure attack that will damage the United States. Again, this pipeline is not guarded. Again, you know, you can basically sabotage this pipeline. This pipeline runs not too far from my house, actually, parts of it. So it's, you know, the pipeline is not guarded. You can go out onto the pipeline and see it. So, I mean, the ability to damage the pipeline is out there. And again, what is the backdrop? What is the backup for that? It used to be a huge, massive tanker fleet maintained by the United States. But as I mentioned to you before, that tanker fleet has decreased down to just basically 57 vessels. And that's 57 out of the 108 vessels that are in the U.S. Merchant Marine. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you got some information about this. Hopefully the cyber attack uh, is resolved and the Colonial Pipeline is opened back up and gas prices can go back down for everybody. But I hope you enjoyed the video. If you enjoyed the video, please like the video, uh, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel for more updates about maritime related topics. Uh, be sure to hit the bell so you'll be alerted when new videos come out and stay tuned for the next episode of Maritime Industry Today. Thanks.